I think uh, Dr. Mears, you mentioned about you know anybody with with any type you know COPD you've, uh, that you need to make sure that you've got pneumococcal vaccine. But if your vaccine isn't available in your pulmonologist practice then how do we make sure that happens? That I think typically we think about put this in the primary care provider's bucket, but is is that, that sounds good, but is it actually a workable solution? So as we as we think about what our new normal is going to be, that that may be something that, that we want to change. So I'll look at meningococcus, hep B, and zoster. So let me start with, with meningococcal. I think all of us have had a situation where we have uh, have identified someone or worked with someone that had um, the Neisseria meningitidis and some of the impacts. This can be uh, a serious and potentially life-threatening infection. Those of us working in hospital have undoubtedly had a patient that was ill and didn't survive this disease. So we know that uh, that this is a problem. There are uh, 12 or so, 12 known serogroups, uh, but we just have a handful. These, these six are the primary causes of disease worldwide that we have been able to identify. And then interestingly, across all age populations, cell group B accounts for about 40% of the, the disease in the United States. This is a disease that is transmitted via the respiratory routes and also through a symptom, asymptomatic carrier. So that uh, we'll have, especially uh, uh, some of our, our young kids may be asymptomatic carriers uh, that they can also be uh, transmitters. Uh, this is why we look at behavior. Uh, what are the conditions that enable transmission? So we think about young people congregating together, sharing drinks, um, sharing the love, uh, and uh, that may also then share the share the the bacteria. We know that asymptomatic nasal carriage is is fairly common, five to ten percent of the population just at any given time. But it also shows us the importance of, of asymptomatic or what carriage does that acts almost as an immunizing process uh, as well for whatever specific serogroup uh, was involved. So when we think about meningococcus, I think it's a, you know, it's got some interesting nuances to that uh, particular illness. But now when we look at rates, we don't have a lot of, of case numbers. And going back to some of the discussions that happen at the ACIP, you know, we look at the numbers of, of disease, uh, but we also look at the impact of disease. So here we have um, a, a disease presence that is not great in numbers, but it can be great in consequence. So this has been a driving force behind looking at, at the low numbers. And the this is a map of the US. This is some of the, the summary data, uh, surveillance data from CDC. And uh, the states that are in purple have the highest rates, the states that uh, that are in cream have the lowest rates, but again, these are this is a nationally notifiable disease, which means if you identified in a laboratory specimen, it meets the case definition. It should be reported. Uh, these should be fairly reasonable rates because uh, testing for meningococcus is going to be in an in, primarily in an inpatient setting in a hospital laboratory. Uh, so uh, that would be it would there would be an awareness of uh, of those um, case rates um, unless the individual was uh, ill and died, and then testing uh, could be done done post mortem, but probably then in a state lab. When we look at the incidence, though, it, it's also interesting uh, in terms of the disease across um, across the the uh, the years that we have seen then significant disease over time, uh, that we've seen a decrease, and certainly that is due to vaccination. I'll kind of show some of those uh, vaccine influences. But when we look at what happens with, across the age span, that we see then that our highest rates of, of disease are in the, the very young. We see it again around the college age, kids, which is why we had then the, the fo focus for um, meningococcal vaccination in that age group. But then over time, as we begin to, to lose either our, our immunity or become then more uh, susceptible to the illness through exposure, then we begin to see increasing rates uh, at the, at the uh, older uh, age. When we look at the incidence of the disease by serogroups, I mentioned earlier about 40% across the age groups um, are attributed to serogroup B, but we have ACWI that is, uh, amazingly, that is in our quadrivalent 
uh, vaccine. So we have two vaccines now for meningococcal disease, serogroup B and then uh, ACWI. We look at the incidence, we see the greatest incidence in the pediatric population, but uh, certainly is present across the, the age groups. I want to, uh, it's interesting, I saw uh, Gary Marshall, Dr. Marshall, not too long ago, and, and he was saying, man, if it weren't for disease in the adult population, we would have no pediatric vaccines. And I said, funny, I was going to say the same thing to you. <laughs> That's a good thing that we had disease in children or we wouldn't have uh, vaccines for the uh, the older population. So it depends upon, you know, which which side of the, of the coin that you are looking at. But but ultimately, uh, disease in all populations, and uh, we want to look at the impact of a vaccination. When we look at just the clinical characteristics of meningococcus that we can see a, a three major presentations, either uh, meningitis, bacteremia, or pneumonia. Uh, meningitis occurs in about 50% of those invasive cases, but 30% of the cases present as bacteremia without uh, meningitis. Bacteremia pneumonia occurs in about 15%, and this is when we what we generally see the, the presentation in the adult population. Now, we, we, we know that if we identify this early and we get the patient treated with the appropriate antibiotic, that uh, the appropriate use of antibiotics can drastically reduce uh, mortality. But even uh, with antibiotic uh, therapy, there's a significant uh, case fatality ratio, 10 to 15%. And if, uh, if then we have that, uh, that, that bacteremia, uh, then you can see it as high as 40%. Those survivors, and I think this has become a lot of the focus for really conveying the importance of immunization campaigns, uh, just as the, the, the consequence that still may be present among those who survive um, meningococcal disease, which may be you know, limb loss due to gangrene, hearing loss, uh, cognitive defects, and seizure disorders. I put together just some basic information about the, the vaccines, just to look at what they are, uh, the, the manufacturer, who the indication is, um, how they're administered, and then how uh, booster doses uh, are provided. Right now, we have two, um, two vaccines that are what we will use primarily for the quadrivalent or ACWY uh, meningococcal vaccine. The, the Sanofi product now is the MinQuadfi that is uh, re really replaced Minactra. This, this has the, the tetanus toxoid, uh, conjugated to tetanus toxoid protein, and then Minveo, that's the GlaxoSmithKline uh, product. Uh, the indication um, is here uh, listed, so you make sure that you are, of course, matching according uh, to your your age group um, and the the again the clinical indications. But also, it's important to look at uh, you know how they are provided because that may make a difference in in your your approach. Uh, for example, one uh, the Sanfi product is a, in a pre-filled syringe. I'm um, in Veo. Uh, one of the formulations needs to be reconstituted. So making sure that when you have the, the vaccine available, once it meets indication, an extra added step to immunization is making sure that whoever is administering the vaccine understands which product you give, how to handle it um, so that it can be uh, delivered appropriately. For, for the at-risk groups, we have... Uh, talked a lot about the importance of, of, uh, of understanding uh, underlying comorbid conditions for our, our respiratory vaccines, and this one is, is no different. And I think this is a reminder that we will see individuals that have health conditions that we just sometimes forget about uh, regarding vaccination. And I bring up uh, you know, the, the uh, individual that lacks the spleen. Uh, they may have a traumatic event, they're in the hospital, they get a lot of attention uh, with their splenectomy, but once their spleen has been removed, then that is a major um, uh, impediment to their immune response. How do we make sure that those individuals who may look perfectly normal, if you don't see their scar, you, you know, they look perfectly healthy, but this may be an issue for them moving forward. So making sure that 
uh, that they have, not only meningococcal vaccine, but the other vaccines that are, are relevant for someone who has been a significant and unexpected loss in their immune response. Um, also, uh, individuals that have been involved in outbreak situations. We've read a lot uh, about college campus outbreaks for meningococcal disease, so recognizing how behavior plays a role in, in placing you at risk uh, for particular types of, of diseases and that your underlying health condition uh, may be, may be uh, not considered to be uh, problematic or may not be at part of that at-risk discussion, but it's actually your behavior. And so then we think about, you know, fresh college freshmen all together in a dorm, a military recruits that will all be together uh, in a dorm, and, uh, and then the behaviors that may occur uh, among those. And then individuals who travel. I think everybody's familiar with the meningitis belt if you travel to areas of Africa. So realizing that what is not a problem in the U.S. or you don't consider to be a problem may be magnified based upon uh, where you may go and what you may be doing in your, in your leisure. Now I mentioned meningococcal B vaccines, and although these are primarily viewed as a pediatric vaccine, you know, there is a, a there is a 25, I think of as an adult, so certainly the indication brings them in, into the adult population, uh, but we need to be thinking about now we have you know two different um, uh, vaccines for for meningococcal disease uh, approaches. The that will cover then that um, the the five uh, serial groups uh, for which we have a vaccine, and so understanding then two different diseases, two different uh, vaccines. Uh, but yet very interrelated. And we have a lot of work and, and on the horizon, we have a pentavalent vaccine that will be available uh, at some point, I'm, I'm assuming before too much longer, uh, that will be able to address uh, each of those, the ACWY and B. This helps with a lot of challenges because our B vaccines are not interchangeable. Uh, we may not know if, if we don't have appropriate documentation. We're not uh, able to capture that information perhaps through our registry. We may not know which vaccine uh, was received. That uh, may be problematic. Uh, so having these combination vaccines is kind of a luxury for the adult population that the pediatric uh, population has enjoyed. And now we may be able then to uh, be entering a point where we will be able then to, uh, to have some of that uh, broader protection through the introduction of, uh, of a combination vaccine. So uh, understanding that very few contraindications and problems other than kind of the usuals, whenever we think about a, a contraindication for a vaccine, it's always uh, a severe uh, allergic reaction to a prior dose or a vaccine component. Well, many times we don't know what that component is until we have a problem uh, with that vaccine, uh, but uh, largely very safe vaccines. And I just uh, just brought up uh, Bexero just because the thinking about the, the natural rubber latex that may be present in some portions of a pre-filled syringe, maybe in the plunger, maybe in the tip. So if you have uh, latex allergic um, a patient's then depending upon the severity of that allergy, this is something that you need to, to be aware of. So making sure that not only the clinician is aware, but people in the office setting, you know, are aware of, of, uh, of these uh, issues to be thinking about. We, uh, we think about them a lot with pediatric vaccines. That's part of just the routine. It's not part of the routine in the adult uh, population. So uh, we'll need to uh, become more familiar. Hepatitis B, uh, uh, those of us working in healthcare have a healthy respect for hepatitis B and, and blood and body fluid. We have with hepatitis B, some areas, especially in areas in Southeast Asia, where we have a higher incidence of individuals with the E antigen, the BE antigen that, that uh, increases Thinking about hepatitis B is an important consideration. And, and even though we have vaccination that's portions of the population without 
infection. When we look at the rates of reported acute hepatitis B virus infection, this is uh, from 2019, which is significant because this is the period of time where we really just see the heighten of the opioid uh, crisis. So a lot of injection. A result of what happens when you have a disease that is transmitted via blood or body fluids, so transmitted then through shared uh, injection equipment, uh, as well as uh, as sexual contact and uh, and other elements of exposure. Also, infants born to infected mothers that that uh, highlighted the importance of including hepatitis B in the pediatric population, specifically um, transitioning and, and having the birth dose um, uh, more pronounced in the, the vaccination schedule. So this is the you kind know, of the hepatitis B strategies that have been employed. And I think this is particularly important because I always look at the right. When I'm looking at these, I always look at the far right and you know we're, we're com completely flat and we're not flat at zero. So uh, it's time, I guess, for another intervention to help us then move, uh, uh, move that curve uh, down more towards zero. But we began to see vaccine for special groups in 1982. That was primarily when, when uh, hepatitis B vaccine uh, was provided and healthcare workers began to be uh, vaccinated. That was kind of interestingly, from a historic perspective, those vaccines were initially given in the in the gluteus and not in the deltoid. And uh, then for some reason, um, uh, there was a question about why, why do we have then the uh, such low seroconversion? Uh, and then uh, the vaccine then was transitioned. Many, uh, most of us then were revaccinated with the vaccine given in the deltoid when we saw then the the uh, increased response. So as the reminder that, you know, vaccines do better when they go in small muscles, uh, unless you were giving a live virus vaccine, you want a little bit slower uptake, and then that's when we'll uh, administer those subcutaneously. But the vaccination strategy then, it was- Do we have an answer? Do you right. remember we discussed this before? We have, do we have an answer why from the gluteus to the delta, the delta works better? I think it, the, the I, I don't know, science, from no, because I remember that scientific, and we couldn't figure out the. I think we've just, seen the, the think we just seen the graphs of if you if you what what was the correlation in the the uh, titers when uh, when a vaccine I'm pretty sure it was hepatitis B that was the example was given in a in a in the gluteus versus yeah. in the deltoid <laughs> and then here were your. No, your this is this is, is clear, but say I, I remember we discussed this before uh, last time. I think that we don't have an. Experience immunological explanation why it's more alert than the gluteal alert. They don't want to go to the gluteal alert. <laughs> why does it? Couldn't find an explanation. Right, and then it was like, well, we don't know, and we don't know anything else. But you got a big nerve there, so we're just yeah. gonna blame it on the nerves. It just don't go there because you may have been. <laughs> but then in 84, we started thinking, well, wait, seeing this increase in hepatitis B. Um, so moving it then into the pediatric realm and saying, all right, can we start and, and start promoting then uh, immunity in the, in the uh, pediatric population that then may decrease then the opportunity for individuals. Then in 91, it was made available to all infants, and the idea was to either give it the first dose in the hospital or at the one to two month visit in the, the and, uh, and then uh, the vaccine was expanded then uh, into the The children started on the slightly to say we want you to forget about doing the one to two month dose as being kind of the option and saying no meant from um, uh, you can see uh, the And in, uh, in the U.S. and then 
the increase in uh, diabetes, some of the uh, reports about transmission of hepatitis B among population that are using lancing devices and, uh, uh, and injection equipment, uh, then pushed into the, uh, the uh, diabe diabetic population in uh, 2011. But after that, we unfortunately uh, pretty flat. Uh, the is, uh, uh, to me, it, it, it's interesting in many different serotypes, but the vaccine that we use um, is effective and covers all of those surface proteins. So uh, the, despite having some uh, variation in the, the virus itself, then the vaccine has been very effective and very um, uh, high in the levels of seroprotection. Again, dosing information, and this to me, it, as a healthcare worker, this is a great evolution because we started with the, you know, with the three dose series. Now we have then the option for two doses, uh, which is a great having the, the new Hepatitis B uh, vaccine where we can be fully vaccinated after 30 days uh, because it's always difficult getting people back, whether it's a healthcare worker or others, getting people back to complete a vaccine series. So if we're able to have um, a, a reduced number of doses, then that's ideal. And then we have uh, a kind of a new kid on the block, uh, Prehevbrio, uh, that also has same indication, 18 years of age and older in the adults, uh, adult population, but still a, a three-dose series. The vaccine, uh, once the complete uh, series has been achieved, whether it's the, the two or three dose, um, the, the long-term effect or the durability, the persistence of the protection uh, seems to be long-term. I think uh, you talked earlier about how do we know? We, you know, when, when do you need a, a booster? Watching those cohorts. So still the cohorts who receive vaccine in the 80s uh, are, are be continue to be followed. Looking at, you know, at what point is somebody going to develop chronic active hepatitis who was vaccinated and initially showed a response that 10 international units, as you mentioned, or greater. Uh, at that point, once that disease is recognized, then you know we anticipate that that will would prompt then the statement about a booster. So that cohort continues to be followed uh, for uh, quite a few years, and uh, uh, we don't have any uh, booster recommendation yet. So I think that's another kind of testament to the the durability of the vaccine. Uh, we hear a lot about booster doses or challenge doses. This is, has become a, 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 an important consideration in healthcare because we are seeing individuals now entering healthcare who receive their vaccines as children, but we don't know, you know, in healthcare, after we receive a vaccine, we have our titer checked. We wanna verify that we actually had a, an antigen antibody response. Well, with kids who are getting it part of their routine vaccination series, no antibodies are tested. So now we are seeing that kids in healthcare who, we, who were vaccinated as children 20 or 30 years ago, and we don't know their status. So the idea now is that, you know, they, that we can do several things. We can draw blood to see if there is the identifiable titer, if we can identify that. But if they are don't reach that 10 international units, perhaps they've got that that cellular recognition and not the circulating antibodies. So we can detect them through our serologic tests. So we can give them a challenge dose, uh, which means we'll see if we give you that challenge dose, then you should bump up your response. And then we, we check your, your uh, check you again for, uh, for titers and uh, uh, series. So a uh, booster doses, uh, we look at this as not necessarily a booster dose because a booster may not really be present. It may challenge dose. So a lot of discussion. them. So dose. When we think about these vaccines, uh, these are larger volume. Immune response. So we talk with our patients about, uh, you know, about the uh, the vaccination. Um, I think Heplasav doesn't it doesn't have that large volume. 
the value of adjuvants in prompting. And so we may feel that uh, just due to the, the adjuvanted uh, response. Uh, serial protection rates for hepatitis B vaccines have been very high, uh, 90% uh, or greater. Serologically, and then over time, being able to see the effect of the vaccine. I think you had mentioned, Dr. Mears, earlier that many times all we'll have is the laboratory. To begin to get that correlation between uh, in uh, in uh, respect to uh, the presence or absence of the the disease. Do you have a question in the chat? I mentioned that you know we're flat, kind of at the at the right hand side of that curve. Information about what is happening regarding rates of of disease. So just pay particular attention to the zero to nine. The, the purple at the bottom and the gray. We continue to have uh, you know fairly low rate. The other making headway in the adult population. So this is why there is a, a great interest in hepatitis B uh, vaccine for the adult population. What Dr. Marshall and I were talking about. He's like, it's, you know, you all are getting the adults are getting the attention for B. The spectrum. So just looking at some of the, the current information about not only about half of the acute B cases reported in 19. Uh, particularly in that 40 to 49 group. So we're seeing then ongoing a so hep B vaccine um, uh, targeting is teen where uh, moms are taking kids. Uh, all other vaccines, um, and we're seeing that in hepatitis B as well. And we just don't see the good coverage. Coverage, uh, looking at again, this was a prior for the two dose series, but we percent in adults, 19 to, to 49 percent for adults age 50 and older. So there isn't the recognition that hepatitis B vaccination is important in this population. We're also looking at uh, acceptance of recognizing the importance if you have underlying low coverage, not only among those that have chronic liver disease, and that's important because what disease uh, occurs from hepatitis B infection, you know, um, uh, liver disease. So we have low rates of vaccination among those uh, with chronic liver disease, low vaccination rates among travelers that are going uh, to areas where infection is endemic. And sadly, um, reported rates among healthcare workers, 67%. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, sad, especially because we have, you know, we have uh, law from to physically actively decline. You have to sign a declination form if you almost 30% of our healthcare workers who against hepatitis B. And given the increasing rates of disease, the opioid crisis and, and so forth, then of hepatitis B infection among non-Hispanic Blacks was triple that of Asian or We need to some of the heat maps that you had. We're looking at poverty. We're looking at healthcare access. We're looking at all of the other social determinants. 
to remember to we have universal hepatitis B vaccination. We need to say it needs to be everybody, not only infant. Hepatitis B vaccination series started. All persons under the age of 19 should be vaccinated. That's part of the pediatric vaccination schedule. All adults 19 to 59 should be vaccinated. And then adults 60 and older with risk factors should be vaccinated. So it's beginning to really get that you know, more broadly. So almost everybody um, is at risk. If you are at risk uh, for infection, so when people may not be thinking, well, you know, uh, really we are. Uh, uh, remain at risk. And then any individuals uh, without a known risk factor are still welcomed to make it happen. Now, how will we to individuals and that there are those discussions with providers uh, that remind their patients about um, the importance of vaccination. I included, since we'll have handouts, I just included just some helpful information so that people can better understand the, the tests that are done for hepatitis B. So they're at hand. So you can begin then to learn what does it mean, you know, with uh, what does it mean when I see HBSAG? And, and people say, I don't need to know that. And I'm like, the number of times the wrong test is ordered because there is confusion about you know what uh, you know what the the correct test is for the purpose of testing, then it's nice to have not only the serologic tests, but also there's the nice chart that uh, that is available on many sources, but um, this came specifically from immunize.org that helps you interpret the results. You of of uh, herpes zoster uh, vaccine. Will develop herpes zoster shingles in their lifetime, and about a million cases occur annually. And you can get it. It's real. And then after you have chicken box, and the uh, the uh, virus then remains in the the dorsal uh, root uh, ganglia. Just, I'm sorry, just to clarify, you said activation of chicken pox vaccine. Once you're infected, then with chickenpox, it can reactivate later. So um, I think we got a a shing facility. You you don't transmit shingles. You know it's not shingles one from the other. Uh, that you know that the chickenpox is transmission culprit. The risk increases sharply at age fifty. So. infection uh, with the wild type is at risk still uh, can develop shingles although uh, that uh, the risk is lower nevertheless if you are at risk uh, for development of, of shingles whether you had it alone or if you got together and had your chicken box parties uh, to make sure that everybody was, uh, was in fact, 1980, we consider that uh, was infected. So therefore uh, that uh, almost that entire population is at risk for reactivation and then development of, of shingles. Triggers for re stand. I was telling somebody, uh, you know, earlier, my, my sister, uh, at young age, no no underlying health conditions, um, develop shingles. So we we don't always understand. We know that for whatever reason, if you were not able to, you know, to maintain that original virus in a dormant state, uh, that that reactivation will occur. We know that if you are immunocompromised, then you lose that ability to retain control over that 
uh, that, uh, that infection or that organism that is present. And so immunocompromising conditions or drugs that can suppress the immune system place people at risk, as well as advancing age. As we think about that immunosenescence, then uh, uh, that uh, places you at risk. Once uh, then the reactivation is triggered for whatever reason, the virus then replicates uh, and uh, the, the uh, disease will then manifest itself with lesions that generally follow a single dermatome. Most of the time it doesn't cross the midline. So you see on one side and that kind of makes it somewhat characteristic. If you see it transmit, it doesn't mean that it absolutely can't, but rarely will you see it, um, see the, the evidence of those vesicles cross uh, the dermatome, but it is uh, uh, it described as being painful. I can't decide whether it hurts or it itches is what, what we'll hear from patients, but if they scratch, it is, it is painful. I usually, uh, again, I said it unusual to cross the, the midline. We, we worry about disseminated um, zoster doesn't happen very often. Um, I, I've personally seen it like in a bone marrow transplant unit. Uh, it's about where we have somebody that is severely uh, immunocompromised and just completely unable to you know, compartmentalize that, and they may see it uh, a more widespread. Um, the biggest problem with shingles is not so much the, the initial rash, although that is painful and depending upon where it is located can be certainly problematic, but it's the lingering pain that, uh, that post-herpetic neuralgia that is the biggest problem that can last for weeks, even years, and can be uh, debilitating uh, for some individuals uh, to deal with. So just some, some pictures that show it may not be something that is very easy to recognize about the most common uh, commonly in, uh, affected areas, and then some of the presentations, uh, that pain, most of, most of the time, again, pain that uh, you can't decide if it itches or it hurts. Um, hospitalization is common among individuals with, with uh, shingles complications, um, and the immunocompromised uh, make up about 30% of those that are hospitalized. And when we looked at, I think one study, uh, interesting from Australia, looked at the rate of hospitalization increased from 6% in that 50 to 59 age group to up to 33% in those as they age. So again, that, that um, aging population at risk for both uh, disease and serious disease. Uh, older patients also are those more likely to have the prolonged and, and worst impact from the that post-herpetic neuralgia. And then deaths, usually less than 100 um, in the US each year, but almost all occur in the older or the immunocompromised. Now, how are we doing with vaccination? Nobody wants to have this disease. I think anybody who has ever had shingles will tell you know everybody in their church group and their social circle about shingles because it's miserable, it's a miserable disease. But despite that, we still see a lack of consistent and uniform vaccination um, across sometimes compartmentalize people and assume that because of political uh, uh, feelings or leanings that you may uh, be more, I think when we look at that, uh, we under groups. And so we see that that clearly across the U.S., uh, perhaps the, the West Coast and, and I think probably the impact of and their very broad reach, um, the, uh, the middle of the United States. But if you look at Kentucky, uh, we are in that area where we, we just... Uh, are not embracing, or maybe we don't have access to, to vaccine. Uh, regardless of the reason, uh, this I have Zostavax discontinued several years ago. It may still be available outside the US, but inside the US, we just edge of into vaccine indicated in, in everybody 50 years of age and older, but also those that are 19 years of age and older who are immunocompromised are also included in that recommendation. This is that six month uh, period. So, you know, as we have looked at vaccine pipeline and allocations and availability, uh, making sure that if you administer 
one for that patient to come back so they can actually get there uh, within that, that time frame that that look at that in terms of disease prevention. Uh, you, we in consideration. The vaccine efficacy that this to me it was, is pretty have such an impact in vaccine, um, especially in the the older adult when we're the, the uh, immunologic response. I like a vaccine as I get to that old age. Um, we, we talk about um, vaccine efficacy and looking at the ideal population, but there's also information about the, the patients, um, cancer patients, and those with some uh, immune-mediated uh, diseases, uh, good responses to this vaccine. We are, we've talked uh, a little bit about patient counseling, and I response we expect and how important that is. And I, I use shingles as a as because this is something that almost all patients, you know, will will tell you. Patients know that this is not something didn't go wrong. In fact, something went right. And so as we think about how we promote vaccine in that maybe this is a population go badly after a vaccine and they may not do it again for other train not only our discussions about vaccination and what what look what is what does success look like in vaccination when we are dealing uh, with adults. So talk about what has happened with the vaccine. Again, I'll use uh, Shingrix. Uh, you may have had a real have spent a day in bed after your first dose and you know have nothing uh, schedule altering with that second dose. And then as we see more um, talked about our immune response, so we have more and more vaccines for adults that so will require that second dose, uh, that making sure that people return back for completion of Do you want to take uh, acetaminophen? You know, we have a lot of discussion with that with our pediatric patients. Uh, we may need to have that discussion with our adult patients. Typically, we tell them, don't take it before. We'll take it afterwards. Uh, if uh, if you feel like that you, you can't uh, power through it and there's no need to suffer, but if you don't need it, don't take it. If it makes a difference in whether or not you, you come back for a next dose, uh, then don't be afraid uh, to. Uh... So not only understanding the vaccines, but these are our discussion points with patients that I think will ultimately help us be successful. Again, you can go back to the... Um, what is happening, what is changing, not only the new vaccines that are coming, differential vaccines for influenza, we have this forthcoming pentavalent. Be afraid to uh, give more than one vaccine when you've got the patient in your office. Uh, don't avoid it. If you, um, if you don't have to administer them both, you don't have to, to do that. But look at every um, uh, opportunity you have with your patient opportunity uh, for vaccination. And then think about the increasing pipeline, how we're going to fold that into our discussions in our offices and our practices.